Welcome to the Swim Swam Breakdown. As always, I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. We are joined, as always, by Braden Keith, Swim Swam Editor-in-Chief from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Senior International Reporter Loretta Race from the French 75 Boutique in Kentucky. How's it going, y'all? Good holiday. Good Memorial Coleman, Day. I thought, I thought we were making you move back to Austin. <laughs> <laughs> you are, and I will be there uh, by next week. Uh, in like a week and a half. <laughs> I, I just I can't stop moving. Intro's over. Let's talk about swimming. We had a we had a lot going on in in a seemingly quiet week. First up, biggest news of the week by far: the OC Registrar put out a report where several uh, Cal women swimmers documented verbal and emotional abuse from Cal women's head coach, Terry McKeever. Um, it seems like this goes back several years. There were uh, Cal swimmers from the past decade who went on the record to discuss this. Uh, the, the, the Cal administration s- put out a response and it was not taken well by the general public. Um, they eventually put McKeever on administrative leave um, and that is, is where we're at with that story. Um, what do we make of this, you know, Terry McKeever news? I think there's kind of two angles to look at this, which is uh, generally, I think there's a shift in attitude in the sport happening. And, and it's an uh, attitude shift that we've needed in this sport for a long time away from these sort of abusive practices by coaches um, that are forgiven because they get results. The other angle is the absolute failure by the Cal athletics department to deal with this. Um, you know, there's, there's layers of the, the woman in the administration who many of these allegations were originally reported to, um, having a very close personal relationship with, uh, Terry McKeever and, and sort of the, uh, conflicts of interests that arise from that. And, um, sort of how they claim that they're using best practices, but there was no too deep check on that conflict of interest to, to sort of prevent that from happening. And then afterwards, just letting Terry go to practice the next morning, read a statement and ask the swimmers if they were ready to get in the water. Uh, You know, it's, it's guilty, innocent, or otherwise (laughs) who in their right mind thought that, having that practiced unsupervised by the administration, at least to pretend like you care as much as you said you care is a good idea. I just, I don't see how that can happen um, after the kerfuffle. Maybe they're insulated from this. You know, it's championship season for a lot of collegiate sports right now. Maybe they didn't really have a good sense of how big the backlash was, even though I find that a little bit hard to believe. Uh, You know, this is kind of, there are a lot of coaches who have been accused of verbal and emotional abuse, and it's, it can be really difficult to sort of discern between tough coaching and verbal and emotional abuse. You know, we get it all the time in the comments and emails, whatever. It's hard to sort of rally the athletes to provide enough evidence, to provide enough support, to provide enough of their teammates backing up what they said to really validate this what when that usually happens is when a lawyer gets involved gets them organized gets the story to a reporter with some organization that's almost always how we see what this happens we we don't have direct information that these swimmers are going to sue but that's probably what's happening here that an attorney got enough of them together over a long enough period of time to put this story together for the oc register in a way that it's defensible and um you know, supported the, the accusations are supportable and, and the accusations are of varying veracities, but some of them are just absolutely out of line. If the story about uh, the response to the athlete committee attempting suicide is correct, that's, that's like inf- unforgivable. Um, and I think it's interesting that, you know, 10 years ago when Terry McKeever was at the peak of coaching, people said, um, you know, what a master psychologist she was, because there's, there's the famous story where she makes her athletes beginning of the year, line themselves up from worst swimmer to best swimmer. And we all talked about 
oh my God, what a great psychologist she is. She takes this seemingly impossible task, convinces the athletes to do it, and somehow winds that up to them winning NCAA titles. Uh, and it turns out that that wasn't health, probably wasn't healthy at the time. And everybody should have seen that as sort of a symptom of what m- else might have been going on. Um, but, you know, it's time for swimming to get past this, this old school coaches can say whatever they want. The athletes, we talked, I talked about this with Mike Murray. The athletes are the customer. The athletes have rights. The athletes are not, do not just exist to satisfy the will of the coaches. Um, and there has to be a balance because the coaches have to have some level of control over the athletes in order to achieve anything in sports. But we are too far from that balance in too many situations. And so we're going to see an overcorrection and hopefully eventually it settles at some more sustainable middle point between what the accusations are here and just a total free for all. She was Pac-12 coach of the year nine times. So my, my question is, so did people just kind of turn a blind eye or did people not know, or did, you know, like you said, Brayden, did, did athletes not come forward because there wasn't like a common voice kind of hurting them together, you know, but it, honestly, if you're a successful coach, you're going to be kind of looking over your shoulder from now on, like who else is going to be suspicious of the way that I'm handling things on deck? I, I, honest to God, I would think that there's going to be coaching changes just because they're going to be feel like they're under the microscope. Which is funny because some of the most egregious things we hear, athletics directors don't make changes until they absolutely have to. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've seen examples of that. And I, I you know, I, I don't have the I haven't done the sort of legwork where I feel comfortable naming these live on on air. But I think all of our readers can think of some examples um, and they keep getting chances over and over again. So even, you know, at a basic level, if we just take the worst offenders and stop giving them third, fourth and fifth chances, um, that's some progress in terms of how they had success. Anyways, I think it's, it's, um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of coaches about this, some coaches who are probably more old school and some coaches who are, very new, very collaborative, you know, kind of this new model of coach. And the, the, the common thoughts I hear are one overwhelming talent. Um, and it's not that you can't get results this way. It's what the impact of the results might be after their college careers are over. That's a problem. Um, and two, everybody lies on recruiting trips, you know, Cal, Cal for a while, everybody sees the Virginia recruiting now, right. And, and how everybody just wants to go to Virginia. Cal was that program for a while and everybody lies on recruiting trips and coaches, you know, a couple of coaches said something to the effect of, well, they hope if they just get one more superstar in there, that it'll fix everything and everything will be better, Mm -hmm. which it never does. Of course it it doesn't, it doesn't change things, but basically Nobody, nobody is willing to fall on that sword on the recruiting trip when they have a, a, a potential Olympian standing in front of them say, you know what, don't go here, go to Stanford, go to Virginia, <laughs> go to Texas. This is not the place we hate it, blah, blah, blah. And so then they get there and then it's too late. And, you know, it's a, it's a good academic institution. There's still a lot of draw at Cal, um, even if you may hear rumblings of this kind of thing, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, you know, it's so interesting because this happened in a uh, women's only program, right? I mean, and it kind of makes you wonder how much interaction there are between the men and the women's teams in, you know, at Cal at other institutions where it's men and women separate, um, because we obviously seen this happen in all kinds of programs, right? And separated and combined. Um, But some of the things that were being reported, you know, you would think that someone else outside of the program would have noticed and maybe said something, or maybe they did. And as you said, Braden, the, you know, the administration just kind of wrote it off and turned a blind eye. I, I had, you know, I have a thought as you say this Coleman. And um, so Cal women's only program, female head coach, the majority of their assistants have been women. The administrator they report to, who is the number two in the Cal Athletics Department, is a woman. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk in collegiate sports. The reason this idea of a senior women's administrator, the reason it exists is the idea that 
it's at least some check on the sort of male dominated world of sports. It's not that the, you know, it's suddenly the woman has this, the, the senior woman administrator has this grand authority over everybody. It's just trying to break up the old boys club a little bit um, in terms of reporting problems or having leverage within the department, et cetera. In this case, that system seems to have failed, right? Because there were many, many women who could have intervened in, you know, and, and some of the assistants may have, you know, some of the swimmers are hinting that some of the assistants may have intervened in some way, but it didn't change the outcome, right? Until, until this became public, it didn't stop whatever was happening from happening. Um, it almost, that's sort of disheartening because you, then how, what's, what's the next solution to this problem mm -hmm. from an institutional mm -hmm. level? If, if, if having women protecting women from abuse isn't acting them from abuse, what else do we have to do it? And it's just like, it's just disappointing because that feels like something that should make things better. And it didn't in this case. Um, so somebody really smart is going to have to start looking now. Okay. What else do we try? Maybe, you know, maybe there needs to be a man involved in a women's program. Like maybe it's the, the, the full opposite uh, you know, although the Cal athletics director is a man and he didn't intervene either. So it's just like, you know, it reminds me of, I went to college, I went to business school in Texas right after the Enron debacle. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, basically individuals at Enron, uh, collude or independently ruined tens of thousands of people's lives by business fraud. <laughs> I'm trying to make this simple without talking down to our listeners, but you can read more about this on the internet. It's well covered. And so there's been all these new rules put in place to keep this from happening. And a lot of the rules are basically you are personally responsible criminally if you sign off on some underling doing something wrong. And all of a sudden, all of the CEOs at all of these Fortune 500 companies are a lot more interested when people are doing shady things because if they signed it, they are criminally responsible. And, and whatever version of that goes into collegiate athletics, be it you know show cause orders that keep you from working in the NCAA for a certain number of years, I think the logical next step is that if things like this happen under your watch and that there is evidence that you knew about it and didn't do anything about it, there needs to be being fired, I don't think is enough because it's just a big cycle. They just get turned yeah. through to another yeah, yeah. program. There needs to be some broader accountability and, and the NCAA doesn't have authority for, for, to prosecute people criminally. Although I wouldn't be surprised if the state of California put in some rule after this. Um, but there needs to be some way for the NCAA to punish people longer term. And we've, we've requested, records from the Cal athletics department about this topic and when they might have known things, but they've told us 10 weeks minimum before we're going to get that because they're dragging their feet as one would expect them to do. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how much anybody knew. Cause as I'm reading all of this, what keeps shocking me is that Cal athletics statement sort of pretends like they had no idea any of this was true. Mm -hmm. They're just as shocked by it as the rest of us are and they can't believe oh my god we're going to now investigate and the athletes are saying they reported all of this to the athletics department and and those two things don't align and i hope this doesn't get settled out of court because i wanted to go to court i want there to be discovery and i want everybody to find out who knew what when and mm -hmm. for how long it was ignored and i feel like on a on a different scale too of just like well you know maybe the, the, there should be change, right? In our sport, it's obviously male dominated coaching wise. And to see, you know, Terry be the best female head coach of all time, sorry, the most decorated, right? She just named to top 100 coaches of all time uh, by ASCA. And then to have this happen like almost the next day or like less than a week later was just like, well, well I don't think our sport needed that one. <laughs> Consider this, Coleman. Terry was named to the USA Swimming Board of Directors, not elected. She was appointed 
Um, I think she replaced somebody who died maybe, but she was appointed to the board of directors after allegedly safe sport um, was informed about at least some of these things. And safe sport has now begun reaching out to the athletes unsolicited, according to one of them. One of them told us that safe sport just reached out to her without her reaching out to them, um, probably because they saw her name in the news. But that means that somebody at USA Swimming knew about these accusations and they appointed her to the board of directors because of what you just said. She's the most successful female coach. It's easy, right? Like when they need female representation to show that they are increasing diversity, they go to Terry. We see this a lot in swimming as the conversation about diversity and representation. The same people keep getting put in these positions over and over again. So it's not really increasing diversity, right? And in this case, somebody there knew about these allegations, but because Terry's the easy choice, the obvious choice, they still put her on the board of directors, which is again, just another failing of the system to protect the athletes. Yeah. Uh, so all around, not great. Uh, we'll obviously, you know, be covering this story uh, as it unfolds more. Anything else on this before we move on? No, let's talk about the cow man. Okay. Let's talk <laughs> about the cow man, which this came out the same day, <laughs> but, uh, Matt Bow or Matt Bowie, uh, as I've heard it pronounced both ways, uh, going to Cal, he's, <laughs> he's Durden's new assistant, Hunter Armstrong, new world record holder in the 50 backstroke national champion in the hundred back is following him. This leads me to wonder if Hunter will stay a professional after going to Cal when Cal has kind of notorious for not letting outside postgrads come in and train with them. Uh, I think we should add a new segment to the podcast where we just give Coleman swimmers names and let him try to pronounce them. <laughs> My favorite game. Um, yeah. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I, so Hunter's Hunter's reason, what we understand for going pro is, you know, cause now they can, they can sign endorsements while they're collegiate athletes. So his reason for going pro is that he just doesn't like short course swimming. Yes. He likes to train long course. On the other hand, Cal of all collegiate programs in the country is the one that seems more willing to just say, okay, fine. Just train long course all, all year long, do a couple dual meets, show up for maybe pack 12s, because remember we've seen them send their swimmers to long course pro swim meets and skip the PAC 12 championships and then go to NCAAs and do your best. And we'll all be happy. Like if, if there's one place in the world where people would be okay with that, it would be Cal from talking to Hunter as how about how this went down. He didn't sort of give an indication that that was on his mind at all. Um, you know, he was aware of the, the traditional Cal policy of only training their postgrads. He, um, you know, Matt Bow had um, talked with Dave Durden about that before sort of everything was announced to see if it'd be okay. Hunter wanted to wait and make sure he spoke with Dave directly. I, I think that there's, you know, he's a world, he's the newest world record holder and that's never a bad thing to have around your program. Dave Durden really loves backstrokers. So having another backstroker is not bad for the rest of his group um, that's training there. And, you know, it's I, other programs that only allow alums, it's, it's as we've talked about before on this podcast, it can be hard to sort of bring somebody new into a collegiate culture who comes from a different culture. But in this case, Hunter is in Matt's culture and Matt will bring some of his cultural influence to Cal. So maybe that's less of a concern than it would be generally. I don't expect Cal to open the, the floodgates on allowing postgrads there because a lot of them would probably go, but, um, I think this was a really unique scenario that, that an exception was made for. I don't get, I don't get the impression yeah. that he's thinking going back to college. I know. I, I think in Hunter's in, in his statement, essentially about why he moved, it was trust communication. It was, you know, basically entrusting his coach with his career. And so I think it, it is an isolated incident where he wanted to just stick with what's working for him. And if that meant going to Cal, it meant going to Cal. Yeah. But he has the best quote ever that the more walls there are, the worse I get. <laughs> that is 
so awesome because that's what a lot of swimmers I think feel that are like true thoroughbred long course swimmers and do not like yards or short course meters for that matter. Yeah. So I, I agree. It's, it's, it's been awesome to see the progression of Hunter Armstrong for the last yeah. two years, really three or four years. Um, I remember <laughs> talking to him at junior nationals and he was like, this is my first summer of swimming. I was like, what? Wow. You just went 49 wow. in the hundred meter freestyle <laughs> um, wow. and look at him now. So it, it, it will be interesting to follow this story. Um, I'm excited for him to get to Cal either way. Well, and Coleman, we have to remember that this quad is going to be different for Dave because he's going to have a lot less international responsibilities than he has in the last couple of quads. Cause I, I assume by his choice or USA swimming's or some collaborative choice, he is not going to be the Olympic head coach um, for Paris. So that frees up. And, and for that matter, I think he's ready to seed some of those world championship and Pan Am games and, and other Absolutely. head coaching duties to guys like Todd. Dismissey. So, um, that, that, that also frees up his energy a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I, the, it was either Greg or Dave on some interview I did with them, um, leading up to the Olympics. And they were like, there's a reason that this is one and done Coleman, uh, uh, talking about being an Olympic head coach. And I'm not really sure if, uh, the U S has had multiple, like someone be an Olympic coach, head coach multiple times, but it, it sounded like they, yeah. you know, they well, did you it once. That, and job good. Either. that job is a, a volunteer. <laughs> oh, <God. position>. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, there's fringe yeah. benefits, but there's no, yeah, benefit. sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, obvious resume booster, but right. man, <laughs> <laughs> for free, that's wild. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, <laughs> we reported that Ariane Titmus uh, was among the oldest to ever to break a distance world record. Um, she was 20, a whopping 21 years old. So practically ancient when she <laughs> broke Katie Ledecky's 400 meter freestyle record, uh, just weeks ago. So I'm curious if you guys think that that if she is done breaking world records in that event, I'm going to sink this. I know we're not doing sink or swim, um, <laughs> but I'm going to sink this. I don't think that age effect is as much of a thing as we get into the 200, 400, as it is in the 800, 1500. Um, I also think it's possible that she's just going to go away from the 800 altogether. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, just knowing she's even as good as she's getting, she's still probably not going to beat Katie anytime soon in the 800. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm putting my foot in my mouth um, and she will, but I, I could see a scenario. Her 200 was really good at trials and I guess she was rested for it, but it wasn't her a number one meet of the year. Um, so I don't know. I, I think, I think she's feeling good. I think she's got momentum. I don't know if I'm ready to call like, Oh, she's going to go three fifty four in the 400 free, but I think she could have a few tenths in her. I think she could get it again. So I'm going to, I think she, I think she'll be faster. Yeah, I do. I, I think so as well, because she only beat it, uh, Ledecky's record by six one hundredths. So I feel like that was like just, you know, just a fingernail. And I think she wants to nail it and just kind of solidify herself as the new women's 400 like queen. So I think she'll have to beat it by a little bit more than just six one hundredths to do that. And she totally has the capability to do so. So I think that's on her mind for commies for sure. Well, and Katie, as you know, Katie was a barrier breaker in this 400, right? Mm -hmm. But like, you know, she doesn't have great turns. She's not. She, she doesn't just, kick. <laughs> yeah. She has like overwhelming. Not quite as sharp. Yeah. To, to be good in the 400. Like, it's almost like she's so good at the 800 that that makes her 400 better than everybody else's. But like the 400 isn't really her best stroke. I would, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw multiple 357s or 358s um mm. headed into Paris from multiple swimmers you know it just it feels like that four minute door has been kicked wide open now and and as we've seen in other events it just rolls in that's a big difference between like 358 and like 356 you know even yeah. a 355 high I yeah. think Titmus is capable of. So yeah. that's what and, I'm looking for. Right. And and that to me is why I kind of said like 358. You know, we've seen two people go 356s now. 
how hard mm-hmm. would it be to see two or three more go 350s and eights? That doesn't, <laughs> yeah, how hard? Easy for me to be sitting in my chair, right? Um, I haven't spun a lap in like four years. But, uh, <laughs> so I think, I think we'll see more swimmers kind of knocking on the door. I think one piece of relevant data as well is that Katie has been at the very top of distance swimming since age 15. Oh, and Ariarna has just ascend it has, you know, has just made it to the top in the last couple of years. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about your longevity in the sport as you age, if you haven't been at the top level at a very young age, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. Zach Apple on the men's side is a prime example of that. I think Ariane <laughs> has more fuel in the tank, um, because, because she just kind of got to this level. And I think that's going to carry her. Next up, Mark Schubert announced that he will take a six-month leave of absence from the swim team uh, in California, which is his pro team that's associated with Saddleback El Toro swim team, to go coach in China. Uh, (laughs) He just started this pro group six, seven months ago, um, and now is leaving it for almost the same amount of time, um, to go coach overseas. We've seen a few coaches do this, right? David Marsh is now kind of, uh, heavily associated with Israel, although I don't know how often he actually goes over there, but he was certainly with them in Marinostrom um, when I was there just last week. Um, you know, now Turkey for a while. Bowman in Turkey. Now we are seeing Schubert in China. Um, what, what do we think of, of U S coaches coaching foreign nations and pu- pumping up their swimmers? I'm okay with it. I think it's kind of the most American thing there is. Um, you know, I, I, I like more good swimmers around the world and we've seen this work. Israel is swimming really well. Turkey is swimming really well. Some of these countries are swimming really well. So you know, on a fundamental level, I'm okay with it. Um, I, what I wish would change about it is I'm not sure. I don't like it when the American club teams get sort of saddled with it. And this was a conflict with Schubert and Mission Viejo. He had a bunch of Chinese swimmers sort of occupying the space in the brand new pool that the Californians and the local taxpayers paid for and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and dividing his attention among his you know, local swimmers and others. Um, so to me, if you want to go do it, great. If your club is okay with the arrangement you have with them to do that, fine. To me, if you're working at a club team, your job there is American 18 and under swimmers or not even American 18 and under swimmers, 18 and under swimmers who live in the vicinity of your team and who integrate in the team um, and are part of your, your regular train groups. You shouldn't be offering things to other countries that you're not offering to your own athletes, special practice times, et cetera, et cetera. To me, it's, um, that's, that's where to me, it's a little bit of a head scratcher because I just don't think, I don't know why a club would accept that, but Saddleback seems to be okay with it. I think a lot of his group that followed him from mission went back to mission, um, be that, before he decided to go to China, after he decided to go to China, I don't think we'll ever get a straight answer on that. So he might not have been left with too many swimmers to train anyways. Um, to, you know, too many super high level swimmers. They've got some other kind of a bigger solid group, but you know, at a fundamental level, I don't think I have an issue with American coaches going abroad, go, go where the money is. If, if the American teams aren't paying you as much good for you. I mean, I think they're just modeling, you know, after what other foreign coaches have done as well. I mean, we've seen Singapore's Stephen Widmer go to China. We've seen Australia's Dennis Cottrell go to uh, China. We've seen you know, Sergio Lopez be the Singaporean head coach. I mean, so other coaches do this all over the world. So it's not unique to Americans. Um, I think they're just following suit. And like Braden said, following where the money is or where the experience is, where the resume building is. And if you were a swimmer at, you know, Schubert's club and you don't like the environment, go to another club. You know, no one's making you train there, you know, especially if, and, in and that if, area. There's yeah, a if, lot of clubs. Yeah. If enough people leave, then the club will be like, Hey, this isn't working. We can't let our coaches go overseas. And then, you know, they react in that manner. But if swimmers are staying, that means, okay, the money's staying and they're fine with it. So, you know, the market can speak to that as well. Yeah. It's kind of interesting how we, as the United States, we think, Oh, we're the best. We're the best. We're the best. We need to keep all of our coaches here, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but as you say, like Ben Titley, he's, he's not Canadian. He was, he created the, and all of this that's happening in Canada is mostly his responsibility. The structure of it is his responsibility. So like, yeah, I think this is a perfectly normal thing in swimming and all sports. And for that matter, mm-hmm. if you're the 20th best swim coach in the United States, you're only going to make X dollars in the U S but you might go to China and make two X because you're still more experienced, more educated than their best swim coach. Mm -hmm. I was having this conversation last week. um, So I'm interested if you guys have any answers to this. Uh, So we've seen a lot of U S coaches, you know, go to different countries. We don't normally see a lot of international coaches come to the U S so Matt bow obviously is, is a great example um, who's, you know, relevant right now. Can you guys think of any other coaches that have broken into the NCAA in a big way that are not American? Brett Hawk. I mean, depends on how you're okay. defining American because Brett Hawk is now an American. <laughs> um, Arthur yeah. Albiero is now an American. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Neil Studd and Neil Harper are now Americans. Um, so yes, I can. <laughs> uh, but But most of them came here through the NCAA system as yeah. athletes. I think Matt, Matt Bo, Bo is kind of, I don't think he swam in college here. Did he? He swam at Loughborough. So no, Oh no. Yeah. 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 So um, I think that's kind of unique. So I was talking to uh, an Australian coaching friend the other day, he and his wife came to America and they partially, they just wanted to see America. They were road tripping around, but their plan was to move their family here. And she's a college professor there's one thing we have tons of in the United States, it's colleges. So they could pretty much live anywhere and they were open to living pretty much anywhere. Um, but he had to find a, a good coaching job. And he's a guy, you know, I don't have his, his resume in front of me, but he's like a, he's a good coach. He's got a good resume. He, I don't think he's coached any Olympic medalists, but he, you know, he's a good, strong club coach. And he said, that he applied for tons and tons of jobs at every level. He got one email response and he got one callback and one job offer. Um, And it was about $20,000 to coach at a private high school, which wasn't going to work. So they wound up going back to Australia because he couldn't get a coaching job. And so I sit and I look around at all of the full-time coaches in America. And I'm thinking to myself, you're telling me that this, this Australian guy wasn't as good as the 5,000th best full-time coach in America, hmm. whatever, whatever the number is, mm-hmm. he can't even get a call back. Um, and so I, you know, I think there's, I think it's, I think in, in swimming in America, people like who they know. I think it's all based on networking and connections or a lot of it. Um, and he doesn't have that network of connections in the United States, like every other coach who grew up swimming here does. So I think that that's a big problem here. I, you know, nobody wanted, in spite of what he's got on his resume, nobody wanted to take a chance on this foreigner um, coming and, and whatever was going to happen was going to happen. So it's, you know, if you, but the, most of those international coaches we named came here through the NCAA Mm -hmm. system. So once you've been an NCAA athlete, you have tons of connections all over the place, not the least of which is the the person you coach for. Um, Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a foreign coach looking to come here, start making friends now. I think that's, (laughs) that's how you got to do it, right? Like you've got to, you've got to know people who will vouch for you. Yeah. Cause I know the the guys at Loughborough were telling me, um, you know, Matt, Matt bow wanted to come to America to coach. He did that his first few years, you know, were not easy. He, he really had to put his nose to the grindstone and take, you know, some, some, whatever he could get and really work his way up to the opportunities that he, you know, finally ended up getting at Indiana and then Ohio state and now at Cal. Um, so that, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Lots of examples, but uh, yeah, come come to America early, I guess. Build your resume. <laughs> we had an unofficial start to it before, but now it is officially time to play our favorite game on the Swim Swim Breakdown, Sink or Swim. 
First up on Sink or Swim today, Ryan Lochte will be on new reality TV show, The Traders, which is, is, was filmed in Scotland. Uh, it, it's, it's a team show where, where there's 10 contestants, three of them are like secret traders and the rest of the group is trying, but well, while the whole group is doing team activities to try to win money in a jackpot. Uh, but again, there are three that are secretly sabotaging the group. I'm curious if you think Lochte will be a good teammate and or traitor on this new reality TV endeavor. Allegedly on this new reality TV yeah. endeavor. This is, he, he has not been confirmed or announced, but this is there. There are very good reality television um, insider gossip blogs. So it's probably legit. Um, I, Ryan is a great guy, loves the kids. The kids love Ryan. I don't want this to sound like I'm slamming Ryan, but his his reality television history is not great. Um, what would Ryan Lochte do was good because of how it bad it was. Yes, it was entertaining. Yes, it was entertaining. How entertaining. bad it was, <laughs> which I think he would agree with. Um, he made it two weeks on Big Brother. He made it mid pack on Dancing with the Stars. I don't know how you win or lose this show. I don't know anything about the show, but just based on the trends, I'm going to say he's not going to be good teammate or trader. Maybe that means he'd be a great trader. I hope they make him a trader so we can find out. See, I'm thinking it because if they make him a trader, like I don't think he'd be able to keep it secret. Like I think he's just so sociable and like personable I just think he would just be kind of a dead giveaway I feel like he's the kind of person that would just lie while smiling and and people like you know wouldn't be able to know for sure but would very highly suspect he would be a traitor so I'm sinking it that would be great television chaos wouldn't it if like the first episode (laughs) he accidentally tells everybody he's a traitor right that's something he would totally do (laughs) yeah agreed so I'm gonna I'm gonna swim it because I'm going with the math here, seven out of 10 chance. He's not a trader. And I think he would make a good teammate. I do not think he would make a good trader. So uh, I'm, I'm just banking on, on seven out of 10 odds here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think he's a good team player. I, Braden, I, I tried to find this out, but I couldn't, I don't know how you win the show either. I know there's a $250,000 jackpot, but like, I don't, know if everyone splits that at the end if they win or if one person gets it or if people get knocked out do we as the audience know who the traders are i would hope so (laughs) well do you remember there was a show called the mole do you remember that anderson cooper hosted that yeah and we knew who the moles were so it it could be in that vein where we might as the audience know yeah it's probably I, I, before your time, Coleman. Uh, it is. <laughs> I was just about to be like, well, they couldn't, we couldn't know because then people would like, you know, put it on social media and then they'd find out. And then I realized that that's already taped by the time it airs. So. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like they've done this before, Coleman. I'm yeah. the best person in TV ever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on from reality TV. Uh, this is real life. Siobhan Howie is recovering from an ankle injury. She is scheduled to swim at the world championships in Budapest. Um, After coming off a double silver performance in Tokyo, do you see her meddling in Budapest? I do. I think what we've learned in the last couple of years is that while foot and ankle injuries aren't ideal, they're also not the end of the world. Um, And Tom Rushton says that she hasn't missed any training. She was able to, to fully train through the Mari Nostrum, you know, kind of getting there early and, working with the Hong Kong physio who just happened to be there, which was serendipitous. Um, But I, you know, I, I think assuming, I guess we don't know for a fact that that world is her focus mean. And I guess, well, I guess we decided Hong Kong doesn't swim at the Commonwealth games, right? Is that what we decided? I I don't know. I think we talked about this. Um, I think they did until the handover happened to China. Okay. 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 Uh, Um, so this, we assume this is her focus meet with the Asian championships or Asian games, whatever. Asian, whatever no, Asian, Asian games. games got postponed. Yeah, they, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we assume that this is her focus meet and, you know, she's tapering anyway. So I think, I think she's still got enough with no Ledecky in the 200 free, no Titmus in the 200 free, um, no Emma McKeon in the 100 free. 
no American in the hundred free. I, I just think there's room for her to still medal. And I think, I think we're finding these foot and ankle injuries aren't the end of the world all of the time. Although we saw it at a major. Um, so I think she's still going to medal. I'm going to swim it. I'm swimming it too. I think for me, I equate it to kind of Showstrom's elbow situation where like Showstrom came back better and faster than we thought she could in that short of period of time. And I think Siobhan is, is in that same realm. She's not, she's not, you know, Sarah Showstrom at all, but she's in that same kind of sphere. So I do think that she is going to medal. Yeah. I'm going to use the same logic to, or similar logic to sink it. Uh, I think Showstrom got her medal in the 50 free, right? And uh, Howie just doesn't have quite have that nitro. Um, I think it's going to be a young person's world championships. We're going to see a lot of stars ascend and like really break out in Budapest. And I think she's going to be just off the podium with that injury being enough to hold her back in the, you know, slightly longer hundred and 200. Yeah. But if she didn't miss any training, why should it, you know, Sarah missed a lot of training with her elbow. So she, the 50 doesn't require the same endurance. But if, if Siobhan hasn't missed any training, why should it impact her 200? Well, Just because, because she's injured, right? Too. Like if she, if she can't, if she can kick at only 80% for the 200, I think that's enough wiggle room for some, for uh, Titmus and I don't know, Macintosh, if she swims it, you know, and, and some youngsters to, to wiggle her w- way in there. What well, Titmus isn't there, but <laughs> No, but I was uh, gonna say so. Make, how many races McNeil, can Summer McIntosh swim? Yeah, but McNeil, what is she, she broke her ankle or had an ankle injury? Elbow. What in April? Uh, oh, okay, okay. So another elbow, another elbow. Person. Like Sarah, but, but less severe. Okay, so anyway, that's true. Hospital. That's true. And yeah. she did, yeah, she did pretty well at Marinostra. She did. So she did. Yeah. So Dude, elbows, come ankles, on, Coleman, are all the same. Come over to the <laughs> swim side. <laughs> but I'll swim it. <clears throat> I give in to peer pressure way too easily. <laughs> Dude, sink or swim. What will Summer McIntosh swim at World Championships? This oh, isn't geez. a real one, but just like, just ponder that, audience. Before I am in the distance yes. races in the 800 free relay, you I think, think they'll... you think she'll swim distance. Like, what do you mean by like four eight or like eight? Mi- She's not going to swim the mile, right? Who's making? I wonder who's making that decision. I wonder if Ben Titley is still making that decision. I do not think so. Uh, I, don't but I, don't know. I think I think I think there's a chance that Summer moves to Spain to train with Ben Titley after Worlds. I would give that a chance. But anyway, we're getting off topic. Okay. Um, <laughs> our our poll this week on swimswam.com was. Uh, which 200 of stroke do you think there is the most variance between short course yards and long course meters? Our voters voted heavily for the 200 breast, even though the data shows that it is slightly uh, more in the 200 back. Do you think that the 200 breast is, has, the, has the most variance of the 200s of stroke, short course to long course? I sink because I hate this poll and I don't know why I let James put it up. Cause I just don't care. I really just don't care. You know, Kate Douglas broke the 200 breast record and then went to trials and had a good long course, 200 breast. So like, what does it mean? I don't know. I just, I just don't care. So I'm sinking it. <laughs> I'm swimming it because no, I do feel like there's a huge disparity because there, you, there's no 50 meter rule, right. In breaststroke. And so you can just extend those, you know, underwaters as much as you possibly can. And we heard, like we said earlier, Hunter says, the more walls, the worse I am. You don't really hear breaststrokers say that per se on the whole. So I'm swimming it. I do think that it has the biggest disparity just because the pullouts are such a huge chunk of, of the race. I didn't follow that at all. That's oh, really, <laughs> that's really this, interesting. This, I just hate this question. <laughs> I it doesn't say poll. what you like better or, you know, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm swimming it. Cause I like Loretta's answer choice. a lot. <laughs> yes, it is. 200 free is a choice. <laughs> then I think 200 freestyle is the answer because think of Why? all of the best 200 freestylers and then count up how many medals they've won internationally in long course. To all of the best 200 freestylers short course or long course, all the best 200 freestylers short course. 
Oh. Well, Michael Phelps didn't swim short course, Hibbler, so that, that throws Grant him House. out. But... Yeah. Okay. What about on the women's side? <laughs> Who was it? Missy? Missy. Won medals. Yes. Katie? Yes. Won medals. Mallory? Has relay medals. Yes. I don't know. It's... <laughs> Spring's just bitter. He just hates the question, so he's really just being do. bitter all around. Really do. Simone <laughs> has relay medals. Next question. All right. <clears throat> yeah, Simone is uh, a great example, a counter example. Thank you, Coleman. That's a good example. She's got she's on the four by two all the time internationally. Uh, yeah, on the relay. It's not the I mean, same as winning an individual medal. It's not, but it's still medals. Uh okay. Anyway. Uh Dakota Luther. Went a near best time in the 200 meter butterfly while training with her mom at her in, in her master's group in Austin, Texas, albeit for five days. She basically tapered with her mom, but uh, sink or swim master's groups could could be a viable training spot for top tier athletes. Uh, Adam Barrett, anybody? Uh <laughs> His, his camp hates what we call him a master swimmer, but he was breaking master's world records two weeks before he won or lost or something, the ISL meet. Um, so I don't know if your mom happened, if your mom happens to be your master's coach and she happens to be an Olympic medalist and it happens to be the best master's group in the world, maybe, but like, we also have to consider the possibility that by training with a master's group, she unintentionally tapered age group meet. Um, by not working as hard. So like, that's also a possibility. I think it's super fun. I'm sure it's a kick for those masters swimmers. Cause I know some of the people that train with that team and they are way into this. So I'm sure they loved having her there. Um, I swim it. It's I'm going to swim it for possible. I'm going to sink it as something I would recommend somebody do in the long term. <laughs> I'm thinking it too, because I was a master's coach and a master's swimmer and we would like drink coffee in between laps and like just talk at the end of the lane. So maybe like Braden said, in some elite pockets of the world, it might make sense, but not in the majority of master's program. <laughs> For anybody who hasn't done master's, there is a wide diversity yes. of focus and effort put into master's swimming. Um, there's no drug testing in master's swimming. <laughs> People are taking all, I mean, your, your favorite master swimmer, your favorite world champion master swimmers is taking at least as many supplements as your favorite Olympian. So <laughs> like there are different levels to master mm -hmm. swimming. So mm -hmm. choose your team carefully. If your goal is to win <laughs> Olympic gold medals. I would, I would swim it for tapering, <laughs> swim it for, <laughs> swim it for a taper. I think take some of the I pressure think, off. Yeah, yeah. I think people should go to a master's workout when they're tapering. It's just, just to get out of their uh, normal routine, just to chill a little. I used to go in Austin, the master team I swim with is coached by Ian Crocker. And I'll tell you what, that is, those are the chillest workouts I've ever been to. Mm. Uh, he, he does 25s of skull and fifties oh, yeah. dolphin kick underwater and, uh, you know, just some speed work and it's a good time. <laughs> so mm. I'm trying to see. So, I mean, look, we talk about masters, but she's training with men and women and masters, the 40 to 44 men's world record in the 200 fly is 205.55, which is faster than Dakota Luther's best time um, done by Dennis Baker in 2004. So like if she's training with male master swimmers at this level, they're certainly capable even into their forties and fifties of keeping up with her, at least in a race. I don't know if they could keep up with her in training, but like they're not, they're not like dogs, you know, like they're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not bad swimmers. Um, especially when you compare the, the male master swimmers to the female elites, they're absolutely in the right territory to be competitive. That's a good point. Yeah. And for the, for the super fan, uh, listeners out there, one of my very first practice in pancakes was with Whitney Hedgepeth at, at Longhorn masters. And, uh, so you can actually watch a practice 
with uh, Dakota's mom's group and uh, they do work. I think they have like hour and a half practices and go 5,000 a practice. Bro, I mean, first, first stop when you move back legit. to Austin, let's make <laughs> yeah. this happen. See if, yeah. if Dakota's still there, especially make this happen. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but not least on sink or swim today, Flynn Southam announced that he will be foregoing the world championships. He's going to focus on Commonwealth games and junior pan packs. Is this the right decision for young Mr. Southam? I'm going to swim it. Um, He's got two other big championship meets to swim this summer, the Commonwealth games where he might get an individual swim and the junior pan packs where he'll definitely get individual swims. So if that was going to be his only championship meet of the summer, I'd say something different. But given that he's still got two big championship meets, I don't think at his age and where he is in his career that the world championships necessarily provide better experience than the Commonwealth Games. Um, So I'm swimming that it's a good decision. And Loretta, I'll I'll let you bring up the obvious example. Oh, that's pressure. Well, I'm just swimming it because they have Worlds next year. So right. I feel like, you know, it, he can bypass one world and it's not like he has to wait, you know, the normal time frame. I am going on the record, though, that I, I still do not think this was Flynn's choice. I do feel it was engineered and he was steered in this direction. So I, yeah, I do. I really feel uh-huh. like he, he was steered in this direction. He was set so, up. And, <laughs> Are the so Australian he, men going to medal in the 400 free relay? Like, is oh he gosh. missing out on a medal yeah. for this? Well, yeah. Kyle's well, there now. Kyle, Kyle's on the team now. Yeah. So maybe. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think I mean, it went from a fat no to like a. Eh, but, but got when a you have a sixteen-year-old, a sixteen-year-old getting third in like a, a, a mm-hmm. traditionally heavy sprint nation, that kind of tells you something about really what the state of sprinting is right now. Which you had Zach and Sturdy, I think is forty-eight high. You know what I mean? So it's and Jack Hartwright was behind Flynn. And anyway, so bottom line. I'm I because Worlds is next year. I'm okay with it, but I don't feel like it was his decision. Mm. The can we not, okay? I'll bring up the obvious example. Uh, Maggie McNeil skipped Pan Pax um, in 2018 in favor of Junior Pan Pax, and we saw how that turned out. Good. That- yeah i'm i feel like this is uh was a softball i think you have to swim this because putting young kids in high pressure situations and telling them oh you have to go fast and swim at the highest level rather than going to a junior me there is a point i agree but and and like you said if it wasn't his decision maybe it's kind of a different conversation but like I think especially this year, a junior pan packs for a 16 year old is a great meet to go to. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we'd like to say that like a, my instinct was to say that a relay swim is a good way to dip your toes into the world championship water. But as we saw in the United States and in Tokyo, if you screw up a relay, Oh, the world comes down on you hard. <laughs> People are not kind to swimmers who have bad relay swims and cost their country's medals. Very true. Uh, kind of well, I was going to, I was going to say, and maybe that's an American thing, but that's definitely an Australian thing too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even, yeah. even more so. Um, I, and, and also he's going to Commonwealth. So it's kind of like, he's still going to a big meet. Um, well, and it's clear oh. they've deprioritized this as a country, right? Like it's right. Yes. They so, in arguably, Commonwealth Games are higher pressure for him, are it, just yeah, based on yeah, what yeah. all all of his peers are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also have to think about the travel, right? Like, if he were to go to all three meets or World Champs and um, and Commonwealth Games. I assume he would stay in Europe for, for that stint. Um, I am curious what Australia, what team Australia is doing because they are only three, four weeks apart, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe five, which is just that middle ground of like, do you go back to Australia and then go back to Europe? Um, But it's, it's a (laughs) A lot lot of people. A lot of of people are staying between Mari Nostrum and worlds. We know that a lot of the, Mm -hmm. the international swimmers. So I would guess they'll stay. Maybe it'll be an individual thing. Maybe they won't stay as a group. There's so many training setups in Europe these days. They'll find somewhere to hang out. (laughs) 
All right. And with that, that's, uh, that's your week's news and swimming. Stay tuned every week to the swim, swim breakdown.